please welcome our moderator for the panel, Zerlina Maxwell. Zerlina is an accomplished author, the director of progressive programming for SiriusXM, and a political analyst for NBC and MSNBC. She also co-hosts Signal Boost with Jess McIntosh on SiriusXM's Progress Channel. Zerlina's latest book, The End of White Politics, is now available on Amazon and your favorite retail outlets. Welcome, Zerlina. Thank you so much uh, for having me today and welcome to our secret origins of Saturday morning cartoons panel. I'm really excited for this conversation um, because I, like so many kids, grew up watching cartoons on Saturday mornings. I'm Zerlita Maxwell and over the next hour or so, we're going to examine the evolution of Saturday morning cartoons, spotlight a few, a few personal favorites and have some fun along the way. So let's get started. Matthew Patterson and Daniel Ferranti, all knowing, all telling, anchoring team of the beloved Warner Archive podcast are joining me today. Also, George Feltenstein, Senior Vice President of the Theatrical Catalog Marketing at Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. And he knows everything about everything about Warner Brothers. So I'm so happy to have you here today. Jerry Beck is a renowned animation historian prolific author, college professor, and proprietor of the highly regarded website Animation Scoop. Leonard Melton is a movie historian, author, TV personality, and one of the best known film critics in American history. I feel like, you know, we're, we're fast friends now because we, we all joined the Zoom a little bit early before today's panel, but I'm so happy you guys are here today. We're happy to be here. Yes. So, George, I want to start with you. I was born in 1981, so I'm a kid of the 80s. And so Saturday morning cartoons um, were definitely something that I grew up watching. And I know that there are a lot of uh, fans of the archive out there. Um, so um, in, in terms of uh, the archive, uh, talk a bit about how the collection started and the ongoing mission, because I want to know now everything about the cartoons I watched growing up. The Warner Archive Collection uh, was born on March 23rd, 2009, as an alternative means for consumers to get rare and hard to find motion pictures and television and animation, and most importantly for today, Saturday morning cartoons, uh, without going to a store. Uh, the product is available online and initially uh, was DVDs that were manufactured on demand. And this had been a project that was about seven years in development. We launched a great success, and it is now 12 years later, and we've gone from 150 feature films to 3,500 releases, and including Blu-ray releases, which we're particularly proud of, and all sorts of feature films, television films, miniseries, and most importantly for today's discussion, uh, classic animation and classic television animation, all of which relate to Saturday morning cartoons. So our mission statement is to work directly with the consumer to get them what they want and let them put, them, put it on their shelf because physical media is forever. Leonard, you are basically the all-knowing yeah. of of film of film history. I mean, like one of the things about Saturday morning cartoons is that they, you know, Warner Brothers had first started with shorts and then it transitioned over once people started having television in their households. Um, can you talk about that transition and how things were repurposed and repackaged and produced, you know, from those shorts into television programming? Uh, Grown-ups in the household could have told you if they cared to that these were the same cartoons, in many cases, <laughs> that they saw in theaters uh, when they were growing up. And uh, on a daily basis, on local television, uh, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City in Teaneck, New Jersey. We had New York TV. Uh, and in those days, New York had a lot of independent stations with a lot of time to fill. And they filled a lot of it with cartoons oodles and oodles of cartoons from every conceivable studio. And so that was a daily ritual for me, not just Saturday. Uh, mm. It was uh, sort of the next step when the networks got involved and realized they had a potentially captive audience to show this same material to on, on Saturdays. 
uh, Sunday was Sunday was already encroached upon by the uh, meet the press type shows. Mm -hmm. so Saturday was the sweet spot, and uh, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour, which uh, was on the air for years and years and years, had virtually no new animation. It was all repurposed, as you say, from the cartoons that had played in theaters. And that also explains, I think, the broad appeal of these cartoons right up to the present day, is they were never talking down to a kiddie audience. Uh, these cartoons were shown with the new Humphrey Bogart movie, you know, or the new Betty Davis movie. Uh, uh, they were meant to entertain a general audience. Good evening, kiddies. Once upon a time, Little Red Riding Hood was skipping through the woods. She was going to her grandmother's house to take grandma a basket of nice goodies. But waiting in the woods was a mean old wolf ready to pounce upon poor Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, stop it! Waiting in the woods with a mean old wolf ready to pounce on poor Red Riding Hood. I'm fed up with that stuff. It's the same old story over and over. If you can't do this thing a new way, bud, I quit. Me too. Every cartoon studio in Hollywood has done it this way. Matt, one of the things I wanted to, to ask you today um, is about how the history um, of Saturday, mar Saturday morning cartoons unfolded, right? Now, kids growing up don't necessarily have the same dynamic where they can wake up on Saturday morning and have appointments TV. We don't have it anymore because there's so many streaming services. So talk a bit about the idea that back in the day, you used to wake up, get your cereal, get in front of the TV. It was, it was a thing that you did as a little kid, and it was a universal experience in that way. It was a ritual. I mean, that, that it really has all of the hallmarks of, uh, of a ritual, and it was a ritual specifically for kids. And that's why kids remember it, because it was a carved out time and space uh, just for them. And uh, kind of coming of age in, in the middle of it, it was like almost a ready-made experience where uh, all of this stuff was advertised to you ahead of time. There were ads in comic books. There'd be specials in magazines. And uh, as a kid, you would could plan out like a schedule, like you were going to, you know, high school or college. Like, what are you going to watch? What are you going to check out? And you'd talk with all of your friends and you'd wake up early and um, there'd just be this uh, entertainment that, and again, your parents this wasn't anything that they were necessarily part of, nor did they really care about because they were, you know, they'd been working all week and this was uh, your time and your place. And I had a little brother, so it was also a time of intense negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, because what would we be watching at what time and how are we going to do it? And, and that was uh, the main thing. In fact, one of my earliest memories was um, when uh, Pope John Paul uh, II died and uh, his funeral interrupted uh, oh. 1978 uh, Saturday morning cartoon unveiling. And I was like, so disappointed. Um, uh, not that I, I didn't really, I guess I didn't care about world history, but I cared about cartoons so much that uh, the ritual being interrupted was just devastating. I feel like when you're a little kid, there there are things like that that are so big, right? I mean, it's like if they interrupt your cartoon, it is the end of the whole entire world. Um, Daniel, what what's one of your most memorable experiences when you would wake up uh, and watch cartoons on Saturday morning? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, Matt Matt just triggered some family trauma. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, calling, I'm recalling my older brothers would like set the TV to the the TV. Yeah, to, yeah. To the channel that they wanted. And they would actually remove the TV dial and hide it. Huh. <laughs> Cruel and unusual punishment. George, um, one of the things I wanted to um, ask you about today is 
the HB Studios, HB Studios and how they um, began producing um, these cartoons for television because obviously that um, had a lot of iterations. And I want to get into some of that history and that timeline. Well, it's, it's perfect that you bring that up um, because uh, Hannah, which is uh, Bill Hannah and Joe Barbera, were employees of Metro Golden Mayor and MGM's cartoon department uh, for over 20 years. And uh, early in their tenure there, they developed uh, a cat and mouse team that eventually became formerly known as Tom and Jerry. And the first Tom and Jerry cartoon, Tom's name is actually Jasper. So wow. one shot yeah. cartoon called Puss Gets the Boot and it was so successful that theater owners wanted more of the cartoons with the cat and mouse. And Tom and Jerry ended up winning the studio a slew of awards. And MGM was having some financial troubles uh, in 1957. And they called Bill and Joe into their corporate offices and said, guys, we're shutting down the cartoon department. You're out of a job. And so they came back to the MGM management and said, hey, we've got an idea we can produce limited animation that you can sell to television for one quarter of the price and we can turn out great television animation for new generations of children. And MGM said, thanks a lot, but no thanks. So Hanna-Barbera were on their own to form their own production company without a backer, but they got some backing from film director George Sidney who they had worked with at MGM on Anchors Away with Gene Kelly when uh, Jerry the Mouse danced with uh, Gene Kelly in Anchors Away, mm -hmm. Anna Barbera had done that animation. And so George believed in their company and he had recently migrated to Columbia Pictures as an executive. So he got Columbia Pictures to invest in Hanna Barbera. He invested in Hanna Barbera and Hanna-Barbera's very first production independently under their own company was a Saturday morning cartoon series called Rough and Ready. What Rough and Ready did was it paved the way for more Saturday morning cartoon programming. Now, mm -hmm. Hanna-Barbera took a little bit of a detour because they started the Flintstones in 1960 as a network primetime series. And they then followed with Top Cat and the Jetsons. And those shows ended up being rerun on Saturday morning. So shows like the Jetsons and Johnny Quest, which we just restored and put on Blu-ray, they were one network season only. And they ended up being rerun just one season's worth of programming for over 20 years. One year it would be on CBS, one year it would be on ABC, one year it would be on NBC, and they just kept cycling that one season for 20 years. Yes, race, it is a long way to Thailand, but it's the only place in the world that particular plant is known to grow. I must have a specimen to check out my formula. Dad, what kind of a place is Thailand? Look down below and you will see, Johnny. It is covered with much jungle like my country. Bandit's going to have to keep on his toes. Those jungles are full of monkeys. So I've heard. You know, some zoologists claim monkeys are smarter and make better pets than dogs. Bandit doesn't think so. I think his feelings have been hurt again. Never mind, Bandit. I still think dogs are man's best friend. That's how <laughs> Hanna-Barbera came to be. And they ended up becoming popular with uh, serialized daytime cartoons like Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear. And those were syndicated to local stations. But the Saturday morning cartoon began for them with Rough and Ready. One of the questions um, I had also was um, the, the timeline of going from black and white to color. Jerry, can you can you talk a bit about how they redeveloped the animation um, that was previously done in black and white 
um, going into color because that's obviously something that it, I mean, I don't know anything about animation and I imagine when there were no computers, um, that process was rather uh, laborious. Well, laborious. Uh, it's not as, well, I don't know if you talk, <laughs> there's a lot of questions there. I'm not sure which one. I'm going to answer one of those questions and then we'll see oh, yeah. if, I, if I hit it. Um, uh, first of all, when they made cartoons like Rough and Ready back in the 1950s, they were actually thinking ahead, color TV existed. Most people had black and white television and, uh, and TV was broadcast in black and white. So most of the original cartoons into the mid sixties were seen mm -hmm. in black and white, but most of them were actually right. made in color in the first place. Oh, okay. uh, there's some exceptions okay. to that, but most of them were made in color. So when color came in, it was easy for them to be able to rerun the Flintstones uh, because right. it was made in color in the first place. What's interesting was one of my little things I happen to like is that uh, when they first did the first cartoons made for TV in color in the late 50s into the mid 60s were designed, although they're in color, they're designed for black and white. Uh, they're, they're colored, they're not, that's why uh, Fred Flintstone's got an orange this and a, a light blue tie. It's all designed so it would play in black and white, uh, the gray tones would read. If you made everything like stark red or navy blue, it'll come out, you know, harsh, come out black or, mm -hmm. or white or something, the wrong color. So um, I, I like fascinated by looking at those cartoons and, and realizing they put a lot of effort and thought into, into that. Now, I don't know if you were also referring to cartoons like the old Betty Boop cartoons and Porky Pig yeah. cartoons that were made in black and white back in the 30s, and then they were colorized for television right. in the 70s and 80s that, that you might have seen. Um, uh, originally, when those were done, uh, they were they were traced, you know, uh, by, a, by a studio in Asia that, you know, did it very, very cheaply. They would literally trace every frame, although we wish they had traced every frame because they didn't and it looks pretty lousy, pretty funky. Uh, plus the colors were all weird, you know, uh, you know, Daffy Duck is purple and things like that. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, luckily, in later years, uh, the computer colorization came in and basically they can apply the color to the original animation and it looks better. It actually looks pretty good in some cases, although we're purists here. So, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, 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 if it was made in black and white, that's the way we want to see it. And if it was made in color, we want to see it that way too. Color TV it literally existed in the late fifties, but, and, and the industry understood that color was coming. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of the TV shows made in the, 50s like Superman and things like that were made in color you know that, that so they'd be rerun later I can fill in the blank here that that Jerry was referring to so basically right. uh in the mid 50s there were two competitive color formats imagine that a format war uh, <laughs> now yeah. we have them in the 70s with beta and VHS there was a color television format and uh, RCA owned NBC, and they had their own system. And CBS had a different system, which was not compatible with RCA NBC system. And both systems were up for uh, consideration as the approved color specification for broadcasting through the FCC. And it looked like CBS's technology was going to be the winner. And it is rumored that somehow David Sarnoff, who was the chairman of RCA at the time, somehow managed to get NBC's uh, color system, which is known as NTSC. And until high definition, that was the US color TV standard. We say it often mm -hmm. stands for never the same color. But in any event, NBC's oh. system got the approval. And as a result, uh, William Paley, who is the chairman of CBS said, there's not gonna be color television on CBS for 10 years. Wow. And held to that, except for the annual broadcast of The Wizard of Oz, where they used the NBC system. The Flintstones was made for ABC, and ABC was kind of neutral. So they did pick up, I don't think, I think Jerry was correct that the first season was only broadcast in black and white. But by the second season, they were broadcasting in color, I believe. And I remember when I was 
very, very, very young, uh, getting to see the Flintstones in color because we were too poor to have a color TV set. And uh, just being blown away by color television. And uh, I, was, I, I feel bad about this now because I would torture my parents, why can't we have a color TV? And they'd say, because we can't afford one. I said, well, how am I supposed to know what color Bugs Bunny is? <laughs> so I mean, you know, my I, parents I are trying to about get it. by and I want color cartoons. I think a color TV in today's money was like the equivalent of like six or $7,000. So mm-hmm. it was a very high end item. And I, I believe the Jetsons uh, was uh, broadcast first in color uh, when it came out. And at the time, only 13 or 14% uh, of people could receive uh, color uh, broadcast. And you had to be in one of a few cities to do it because it wasn't even broadcasting in color in most markets. I mean, not, not to get too far afield, but we all remember like the opening of Batman or that girl it's right. in color, you know, at the end of that year, 66 or so was the year that 67, everybody. Yeah. Well, everybody what had. happened was that in 1965, William, William S. Paley decided his 10 year moratorium and war against the NBC system was basically over. And that's why you start seeing Andy Griffith shows in color. Right. And uh, my three sons moved over from ABC and that became color. And uh, Beverly Hillbillies became color. And by 1967, I think the full network programming of all three networks was, yeah. you know. So one of the things you, very fast. one of the things you mentioned is um, sort of the battling between CBS, NBC and ABC. And, and obviously they were already battling about um, putting things on TV in color, but they were also battling over the content that they were gonna air on their channels. Um, J- uh, Jared, do you, can you talk a bit about sort of the network wars? This is one of the things that I, I mean, I wouldn't have any, had any conception of that as a kid growing up as just somebody watching the cartoon, um, but obviously, uh, these companies um, were fighting over the content and the content was going from one channel to the next channel and then re-airing. And I, I've never even heard anything like that in mo- in modern times. So um, it, it seems like there was a lot of drama. Well, in the beginning um, of, uh, of Saturday morning, uh, to me, Saturday morning, even though it existed in the 50s and in the early 60s, it was mostly reruns. Uh, or Western shows or puppet shows and things like that. And then slowly the cartoons were being made for, for TV. And by 66 or so, 65, 66 to me was the beginning of in mass uh, animation on, on, uh, on TV. And in the very beginning, you know, it was, it always was a thing where uh, finding a pop pre-sold characters, pre-sold, you know, whether it was Bugs Bunny or uh, something that was popular in some other format, Previously, um, the Beatles cartoons, there were all kinds of things mm-hmm. that were on. Finally, though, in 66, when Saturday morning was really going full throttle, that was, of course, the year of the Batman TV show. There was a big superhero craze that year, and thus tons of superhero shows. Hurry, pal! This rocket's about to blast off! <laughs> I'll be back in a jiffy, Buzz. I've got a rocket to reverse. Wow, that's a first for superheroes. Thanks, Buzz. Yikes, here we go again. That'll teach him to keep his mouth closed. Look out behind you. Sorry about that. CBS in particular uh, went out and got Superman, you know, and Aquaman. And uh, uh, meanwhile, NBC was left with uh, Super President. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> all they had these little weirdo shows they would invent for this kind of thing. But of course, that brought us uh, originals like Space Ghost, which was my favorite, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, TV's. Saturday morning is a, is, a, is a graveyard of superhero shows that of, of forgotten characters that nobody remembers anymore. Leonard, can you talk about that 
that moment where companies realize they could partner with the toy companies and then, you know, the popularity would just explode around those Saturday morning cartoons. I remember watching the very first broadcast of Huckleberry Hound, which was on a weeknight. Uh, it was once a week for a half hour. And uh, Kellogg's Cereals was not only their sponsor, but they were integrated into the opening titles and music. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was very organic and to some people's minds insidious. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that continued uh, in, in very ambitious ways with Mattel and uh, other big toy makers getting involved right. with the creating characters or inspiring characters, G.I. Joe uh, and, and many others along, uh, along those lines. And at some point, there was a big backlash because uh, by this time, the Children's Television Workshop had been created and and uh, got Sesame Street on public broadcast mm -hmm. and this was kind of this was the uh, role model for what children's television should be and ought to be in many people's minds uh, uh, free of commercial consideration in fact they wouldn't license their characters for toys and such you ultimately you could find uh, Muppet toys and Muppet characters, but not the Muppets that appeared on Sesame Street. So they were kind of pure. And this inspired uh, a, a number of uh, do-gooders seems like a, a critical term, but in this case, they really were do-gooders who wanted to rescue innocent children <laughs> from, uh, from the uh, drum beating of uh, various companies trying to hawk their products. And uh, uh, they weren't very successful. <laughs> no, I don't think that they were successful. Money in that regard. Daniel, what were you, what, some of your um, memories in terms of the toys you had growing up that were tied to um, the cartoons that you were watching? Are there any that stand out? Yeah, I mean, there was the whole 70s line of uh, both Marvel and DC action figures. I mean, I don't know. There's a couple behind me, actually. Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> There's like a Superman and a, and a Robin, I think, over there. Uh, definitely that. There was the, the, it was promoted on Saturday morning. They didn't have a show, but there was, a, as a little kid, I was fascinated with the, the major Matt Mason toy line, just because that was also the early days of Apollo. And those, those commercials sort of ruled the roost in terms of what you would see on Saturday morning, along with things from Ideal and whatnot. Uh, and then, of course, there was whole just, you know, because those Saturdays were the kids days and it was this ritual as Matt said like some of my favorite just Saturday morning memories consist of uh you know, you'd have to split the difference between am I going to go outside and play and run around because it's a nice day or am I going to watch well maybe it's repeats and you'd go outside and you'd start to play and then your siblings would be on the porch screaming space ghost robot spy <laughs> have to run home that's great Matt do you have any memories like that one of the more interesting things about Dan is uh, Dan still fills his spaces with toys from uh, current <laughs> animation. Uh, and he has lined his desk at work with modern uh, uh, action figures to the point that you can't see him in <laughs> his cube. That's uh, so Dan, Dan was being rather modest. Um, my mother was one of those uh, kind of do-gooders. Uh, she believed in uh, that uh, it was bad for kids to have more than a few hours of screen time. Uh, so I would, uh, and, and she also believed in not really, that we didn't really get that many uh, tie-in toys. So I would have to plot. Uh, and you know, like certain times of year. I mean, this was this was a, a my ritual. You know, like uh, it, but I had the plot so much that this is now my career. So <laughs> I, I just want to say thank you to the FCC and my mother for limiting my exposure to these things because uh, it has set me off on a journey that continues to this day. And, really and of funny. course, I discovered, uh, thanks to Jerry, Johnny Cipher. Johnny Cipher. In Zero, perhaps something that if I had seen as a child, 
maybe would have pushed me over the edge uh, into insanity. So I'm, I'm glad I, I waited into my ripe old age to see it where um, I know now how to compartmentalize uh, Johnny Cypher's reality and uh, yeah. what we believe to be reality today. That's it's available on DVD. I think this is a good opportunity to explain where the Warner Archive. Uh, yes, that that was my very next up. question, George. Yes, oh, perfect. tell me what, well, what's coming. Yes, tell me what's in the works and coming up with the Warner Archive. Well, first, I'd like to mention that um, when I made, I, I started in the video business at MGM, and then I moved to Warner Brothers. When I came to Warner Brothers, Jerry begged me. He was like. <laughs> you've got to put out Johnny Cypher. <laughs> and he was very emphatic about it. And Jerry and I have been working on animation projects for years uh, <laughs> on video market. And uh, uh, between Jerry and Leonard, all of my animation education uh, is in their hands. I've, I've learned from the best and worked with the best and, uh, their contributions to what we do are in, incalculable. So I just have to honor that. And they happen to be my dear friends. So I'm grateful for that. But in, in terms of what, what's coming, uh, Dan mentioned a cartoon that was really integral in the change of Saturday morning content. And that is Space Ghost. Mm -hmm. Space Ghost yeah. was representative of uh, the change at Hanna-Barbera from cute animal creatures to more comic booky like action uh, adventures. And we are in the process now of, and this will be an, uh, a Comic-Con online uh, announcement uh, piece of news when people hear it, uh, we are completing remastering and restoration of the original Space Ghost and Dino Boy series as originally seen on network television uh, from the 35 millimeter elements in high definition for the first time. And we'll be putting those out on Blu-ray and that's part of the Warner Archives mission right now is to get this great animation available in HD. And this is an opportunity for me to mention something that Warner Archive is not doing, but that Warner Brothers Home Entertainment is doing. And by the time this is uh, seen, uh, this will be public knowledge, but I've been involved in uh, supervision of the mastering work. The original six seasons of the Flintstones that aired on ABC and then went to Saturday mornings and syndication have all been remastered in high definition for the first time. It will be coming out later this year. as a big honking gift set with all sorts of exciting extras. And they've all been remastered and they look amazing. They haven't been remastered in 25 years. If you make these things look and sound beautiful, they live on. And that's critical to what we do within Warner Brothers. One of the other things that we're in the midst of doing, and we started doing at the beginning of the year, we released our first volume of Tex Avery Screwball Classics on Blu-ray. And this is something that had totally bypassed DVD because these cartoons had been in need of restoration. It was a very expensive process. The company needs to make a commitment to it. And that commitment began at the instigation of the Warner Archive, and we released the first Blu-ray in February of this year. And Tex Avery Volume 2 will be coming, and it will look wonderful. Where Tex Avery ties in with Saturday mornings is that Tex Avery cartoons really didn't feature a particular character with one or two exceptions. And they, uh, Tex Avery cartoons were a huge influence on things like The Mask with Jim Carrey, or mm -hmm. most prominently Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a love letter to Tex Avery. 
But uh, Tex Avery created Droopy the dog, and that's his most famous uh, character creation. And uh, that is how Tex Avery first appeared on Saturday mornings on CBS in 1965, along with his more famous pals from the MGM cartoon department, Tom and Jerry. So you'd get two Tom and Jerry's, and in the middle would be a droopy cartoon. So that's where Tex yeah. Avery ties into Saturday morning. Thing. When you mention the Jetsons or uh, the Flits, the Flintstones, uh, both of those shows were about a reality that we we weren't experiencing. <laughs> both um, one was in the future, one was in the past. Um, so Matt, you know, how, what do you think the reception or sort of even the processing for kids all the way up through adults will be? Um, you know, when they watch the Jetsons. The worlds that they build are so beautifully rendered and so well thought out and, um, and consistent from show to show that like any fantasy or science fiction experience, you're, you're just drawn in. And the fact that you'll be able to do it not once a day, you know, five days a week or just mm -hmm. on Saturday mornings, but that you can completely immerse yourself is uh, I think kids will take to it just fine. And I think that, again, since these were made for primetime audiences, adults will also uh, be drawn in just as much. They, they, so, they hold up so well. And um, even though they're from another time, uh, because they represent another time and place, it, it doesn't lose anything. I just want to ask uh, uh, George in particular, George and Jerry, okay. if somehow they could uh, make it possible to watch these off-network shows on a 17-inch black and white screen <laughs> to more authentically represent the way I first saw them. If yeah. anybody could pull that off, it's Matthew Patterson. <laughs> way to make we, it happen. We could we could make a special feature where we put uh you know a 17-inch black and white screen and add uh yeah. noise and yeah, scratches and slices and dirt. A little, a little horizontal, horizontal flutter, you know, all yeah. of that. Right. Yeah, I, FM I, radio broadcast breaking in. You know, a good story draws you in regardless sure. of the quality, uh, but great quality also is immersive. And that is uh, what we have now that we, you, you couldn't have before. Daniel, um, I guess this, I have a similar question. Do you think the kid, the the cartoons of the back back in the day, will be something that kids will understand and be attracted to those stories? I mean, yeah, because um, you know these were created by by very talented writers and artists who, uh, you know, back back in the day had a little bit more of a free hand. I mean, not not in terms of explicit content, but just. Uh, they, they were producing and delivering shows and they were trusted and they had their own, you know, in-house filters, but um, they're still engaging. Uh, and if you make the presentation more seamless, the kids are just going to watch it like they would watch right. a modern show or an anime or whatever. But what they also get out of it now as because because these kids are super media sophisticated in a way none of us are. Mm -hmm. and, and they are able to view these things on two tracks. On the one track, they're just watching the show and they're liking it. And the mm -hmm. other track is they're aware they're getting a time machine into the myths that America told about itself back then mm -hmm. and start to understand where we are now because of that kind of storytelling and as it's changing. So it gives them a real window into like their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents' lives at the same time. That's an interesting point. Um, Leonard, do you think that um, the stories that they're telling and the perspectives um, that the stories are told from in these older cartoons, to Dan's point about how, you know, kids are more critical about older content. We're consuming it sort of with a more critical eye um, and, you know, a different, a different a lens. Um, do you think that the, the, the cartoons from back in the day um, will resonate in the same way, given the point Dan just made about, um, you know, that the messaging, it needs an adjustment. Yes, well, everything, 
Everything yeah. not made in the last month and a half needs an adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's all true. Uh, you know, you cannot hide or deny the fact that they are not uh, made uh, with an enlightened point of view uh, about society. They did reflect the way society was, by and large, in their era. And that's why they were so popular. That's one of the reasons they were so popular, uh, because people young and old connected with them. Mm -hmm. I think that because they are broad in their approach to comedy, uh, except for the, uh, you know, the adventure ones like Johnny Quest and such, uh, I think they will still play today. And because cartoon characters are kind of uh, uh, exaggerations uh, of, of human beings, uh, that uh, I, I think they would still work. Obviously, if you were if you were producing new episodes today, you'd have all the things we want to see in all of our entertainment: more diversity, a um, uh, greater sense of inclusion, all of those things that we aspire to, and uh, that we're overdue to have without making an issue out of them, just having them there. Uh, but I, I don't think it's going to um, prevent any any young person from just laughing enjoying matthew george <laughs> daniel jerry and leonard thank you so much it was really fun having this conversation i want to say goodbye to everyone and thank you for joining us